All right, we are back. Look who's on the screen with me. Drew here at thatanxietyguy.com, back with Holly in Yay. Mallorca. It's been like a year, I think, Holly, I think It's been a more than a year. I was pregnant last time we did this, and wow. now I've got a... And Missy is a... like off to college, so... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, been a little, it's been a while. It's been a minute, as they say here in the States. So um, today we are going... For those of you who were following along with Holly and I a year ago or more... We were going through Hope and Help for Your Nerves, right, by uh, Dr. Claire Weeks. Quick recap, Australian, she was a physician? I don't remember what she was, really. She wasn't she a, was she a therapist? definitely a doctor. She was a doctor uh, of some kind. Think, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if she was an MD or a PhD. But anyway, um, she did most of her work in the 50s and 60s, centered around anxiety disorders and how to deal with them. And I think we both tend to agree that her writing is the gold standard to me. On, on, you know, how to deal with these issues, panic, anxiety, yeah. phobia, that sort of stuff. And so Holly and I started last year going through Hope and Help for Your Nerves, which I think was may have been her first book. I'm not sure. Yeah, I just want to make the point because I had to yes. download this yesterday that Self-Help for Your Nerves by Dr. Claire Weeks is exactly the same book. I think one's like a British and American or something like that, but it's the same book. Maybe. So. Okay, so Hope and Help for Your Nerves or Self-Help for Your Nerves, same book. So if you don't have it, it's cheap on Amazon. You could download it as a Kindle book. It's out there. Uh, it's it's a relatively yeah. inexpensive book. If you want to grab it and catch up with the uh, episodes that we did last year, I've actually on my YouTube channel, I made a playlist for these. So you can watch chapters one through five. Today, we're going to go through chapter six. Oh, cool. Right? And we're going to try and keep continuing along. For those of you who have been patiently waiting and asking <laughs> on a weekly basis, some people, I appreciate those feedback. When are you and Holly going to do this again? Well, here we are. So welcome back. Yeah. Sorry for the break, but we're here now. Oh, it happens. Like never. <laughs> it happens. So anyway, um, this chapter, chapter six, which she calls Cure of the More Constant Symptoms. What do you think? This is the this is the chapter. This is what it's all about. This is the chapter for me. This is where she talks about how to actually deal in a practical way with your symptoms that you are const like the ones that you're constantly suffering from like not necessarily like this isn't necessarily like the when you're in the middle of a panic attack this is the sort of every day oh my god I feel this and this and this and you know um and she talks how to deal with that on yes. a practical level and I think maybe it's not when you're in the middle of a panic attack but it's certainly I think it applies even in the middle of a panic attack. It's the, yeah, it's the, the hardest same. way. She mentioned something in the middle of the chapter about the peak of experience, which I think is how you're dealing with these symptoms at that peak, that elevated level 10, yeah. you know, five alarm panic. Um, so I think the advice in this chapter is relevant with just background anxiety, individual symptoms, collections of symptoms, and even when you're in full-blown panic. And really, if you learn how to deal with the symptoms the way she's teaching, you start to wind up less, I think, in panic. And, you know. Yeah, absolutely. It tends to short-circuit it. <clears throat> because once you... So the whole idea that we're talking is the... So we've talked in the past about the, the fact that the symptoms that you're feeling are just the result of adrenaline. And adrenaline is there because your body thinks that you're in a, a state of danger. So it's trying to give you the physical ability to get out of that danger. And you've got to tell your body... No, 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 wait, I'm not in danger. Um, and the hardest bit about that is that you feel like you're in danger and, and the symptoms make you so worried that you you feel so scared of them that your brain can only interpret that fear as danger because why would you be scared of it if it's not dangerous? And so your brain is interpreting it. So the whole idea is that you have to break that circle. And the way you do that is to not show fear to your symptoms. And the way you do that is how she tells you here. Yes. And so, like, let's just look at the first thing that she says. She says, first, look at yourself and notice how you are sitting in your chair. I have no doubt you are tensely shrinking from the feelings within you. And I want you to do the exact opposite. I want you to sit as comfortably as you can and relax to the best of your ability by letting your arms and legs sag into the chair as if charged with lead and take a slow, deep breath through your partly opened mouth. And like, so even that on its own is actually like really hard to do when you're tense because you're, you feel like you're constantly having to guard yourself and watch yourself and and sort of like be ready to fight the anxious feelings that you're feeling. Yes. But if you actually just relax into them, relax your body, like nothing's going to happen. It doesn't 
make it worse. That's and it true. feels like it's going to at the po- just beyond the point of where you actually do it. You think this is going to make it worse. When you actually do it, you're like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Nothing got worse. I don't need to be sat like this, actually. I can be sat like this. And nothing gets worse. And that's the very first, that's the number one step of a thousand mile journey or whatever is just to. Yeah. To just do it. And it's doing the exact opposite of what you think you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. Um, And you're right. It's really, we've probably said this a year ago in almost every chapter. This, that concept of like just. Stop doing what you're doing and do nothing. She even yeah. mentions something called masterly inactivity later in oh, the chapter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and I, I've said in, in other venues and other podcasts and stuff, you can either do something when you feel your symptoms or you could do nothing. And doing nothing is faster than doing something in terms of feeling better. And this is exactly what she's saying here. You, you, you have to develop the ability to just go limp in the face of wanting to fight and gird yourself and hold yourself and catch yourself and notice every little thing and engage in the crazy inner dialogue. No, you have to do none of that. In the end, what she's saying here is do none of that. So if you want your symptoms to go away, ultimately, that's not the primary goal. That's a secondary result. But if you want your symptoms to go away, this is what you have to do. Nothing. Do nothing. Dr. Week says. Just let them happen. Just let them happen. And it, when it's an, it sometimes it feels like there's an onslaught, right? You're in the middle of this raging storm. And for me, we'll talk about her acceptance and her floating in a second. Yeah. For me, I've always framed it. Acceptance is, is huge and you have to fully accept. We'll talk about this next in order to be able to do this. If you haven't accepted your symptoms as harmless, truly 100% resign yourself to that fact. You, you won't be able to do this. You won't be able to do this. Yeah. So that's job number one. But she talks about floating for me. I've always framed it in terms of bending. So think about like a willow tree. When the wind is howling at that tree, it doesn't brace against it. It, uh, it right. Uh, it doesn't brace against it. It just, right. It bends and it never breaks. So, you know, that's such a core concept here, floating, bending without breaking and being soft in the face of that. Strength is in softness here as opposed yeah. to in, uh, you know, hanging on. So let she says it. I mean, she goes through individual symptoms, which maybe we don't have to do so much. But when she talks about doing nothing, she also talks about, let's talk about the, the thing where just like a broken leg takes time to heal. I think this is when she's talking about, I think. Yeah. So she's saying like, right. so the moment that you accept it, so say that you have accepted it and you're now like going like, no, I'm not scared of the, of that sort of weird, like inability to catch my breath sort of thing. Like it doesn't scare me. I'll accept that I'm going to feel like that. It doesn't mean that you're instantly now going to feel completely better and be better because it is like that's that now it's the broken leg bit that needs time to heal. But you can't just you can't sit and expect that you'd been doing what you've been doing the whole time and it would get better like a broken leg. You've got to make that action of just and it's so subtle. This is what's so hard about it is that people must think that they've tried this at some point and they go, well, it didn't work for me. But if it didn't work for you, it's just it sounds like really patronizing and horrible to say, but it must be that you didn't try hard enough, you didn't quite have the mindset exactly right, or you just didn't quite understand something about about it. And it's so subtle, the difference between getting it and not getting it, that once you get it, you have to get back. You do, you will get better. You right. will recover from it. There's no choice. It, it's impossible not to. It's that, just logic. That's exactly you know? right. And it's just, and you're right, that difference is, it's almost indefinable. The difference between saying like, well, I'm not afraid of that anymore. And really, really excited. Like you get, I, I think most of us get 98% toward that spot. And it's that last little 2%, that subtle nuance of saying, truly saying, yeah, whatever, dude. Like, you know, I, yeah, I truly yeah. do not care anymore. Um, you have to get to that point where, and, and then you can do nothing. You can relax. And when you do it, what she's saying is, you're right. You're not going to instantly feel better. It's not an instant cure. You're still going to react. You're still going to have symptoms. You're still going to be afraid from time to time. And it's a slow process. You will you will change from being on guard and afraid and worried and trying to stop these things and fighting against them. And you will slowly start to change that mindset. And she talks about how your symptoms are a reflection of your mood. When, when you're on guard, you are and, and, and afraid and worried, you're, you're starting to feel these negative things. 
when you truly let it all go, accept it and just let it come and do its worst, which is nothing. Its worst is nothing. Yeah. Um, that's when you begin to change. And it's not that you suddenly go from being housebound to going on a world cruise, but your attitude changes and suddenly things do slowly begin to fade into the background. Yeah. So your palpitations and your jelly legs, your dizziness aren't going to stop instantly the moment you do that. It will take some time and practice of doing this, and but they will begin to fade into the background. And then all of a sudden you'll discover like, wait a minute, all of a sudden I'm not having them anymore. Yeah. But, but the first step is still having the symptoms and just not caring. Yeah, you've got like she makes a really big point about you've got to be prepared to feel the symptoms and just carry on working or whatever it is that you're doing, regardless of them, like whilst you're feeling them. She's like, if right. your hands are trembling, they're still good hands and you can still use them. And you just go and you carry on and you're going, well, oh, OK, my, my hands are trembling. But like. So what? You just carry on doing what you're doing because if you stop and you go, oh, my God, my hands are trembling, right. then you're just sending more signals to your brain that, like, you're scared and therefore you're in danger and your brain's just never going to get the message that you're not in danger. You need to send the message that you're not in danger and you do that by not being scared of them, and I, of I, the symptoms. That's true. And I think – I don't know if you would agree with this, but for me – what I find is even when a symptom hits after you've reached this level of true acceptance and you can truly float or bend or whatever we're going to call this, you know, I, I will still acknowledge it like oh, I'm feeling dizzy right now. But it's, it's literally mm -hmm. just that one sentence. I'm feeling dizzy right now. And it doesn't matter. I don't stop to think about it. I don't think about it. I don't do what if. So that's the difference. So if you are at that state right now where you, you are insisting I'm not afraid of these things anymore, like I'm not afraid of this anymore. But I, I will say this, and, and somebody out there that's listening I know is going to relate to this specifically. If you tell me, and I mean me personally because I have people messaging me all the time. If you tell me that you're no longer bothered by that symptom, yet you are messaging me about that symptom, then you are you're still bothered by bothered it. Bothered by it. Yes, yeah. yes. So and that, even if you're that's bothered the nuance. by it, that's the it nuance. doesn't matter if you're like scared or right. bothered. The fact that you're showing it any sort of like respect yes. it mean, is is the same thing. And you need to just ignore she says she makes a really good point. She says like she talks about the churning stomach or mm -hmm. like you know, like just stomach problems. And she goes, like, if you had a bit of arthritis in your wrist, you wouldn't be like going like oh my God, I've just got this like little tingling in my wrist the whole time and therefore I can't do anything. You'd just be like, oh, this is kind of annoying, but I'll just carry on anyway, you know? And like, and she's just like, why would it be any different that it's in your stomach or in your chest or in your head or whatever it is? It's just like, it doesn't matter what the symptom is. It's just that you're reacting to it and you need to stop reacting to it and you just need to carry on regardless. But like, oh yeah, I'm feeling kind of weird at the minute, but I'll just carry on right i'm just gonna to keep going anyway or it doesn't matter yeah. and, and even for somebody who's in my situation years and years down the road there are still times and for me it's always like that little dis dizziness disorientation derealization thing when it hits me and i'll be in the middle of something sitting in a meeting in my business or whatever it could be anything i still have to consciously say like oh here it is again just yeah. keep going drew i have to actually just tell myself that still even now then I'll just keep going. And then sure enough, it begins to fade. And for me, it fades yeah, quickly. Yeah. For you, it might take longer if you're still at the beginning stage of this, but you'll get to that point where like, I don't pay it any mind. Oh yeah, just keep going. Don't worry about it. And sure enough, within five minutes, I'm not even thinking about it anymore. It's gone. Yeah, yeah. For yeah. me, I kind of like just, res I feel it every night. If I'm very stressed, especially, I do yes. still get like symptoms of anxiety. Sure. Sure. And I just go like, Oh, do you know, it's really weird. I feel really anxious at the minute, but I don't know. I'm, I guess I must just be stressed. And then I just carry on my day. And it's not like, oh, brilliant, I'm feeling anxious. But it's not like, oh, my God, I'm feeling anxious. It's just like, it's weird, I'm feeling anxious. Kind of like, you know, that's anxiety I'm feeling. Yeah. I must be stressed. It's kind of like a point of interest. It's not like a point of, oh, my God, or, or fear anymore. And, and then it just – I mean, I don't even remember thinking it again, you know, like I sort of think it and I'm like, that's weird, I'm feeling anxious. And it, it might even get a little bit, you know, intense. And within sure. 10 minutes later, I, I've completely forgotten about it. You like know? it, like it never just, happened, right? Yeah, because yeah. I'm thinking about something else now. Or, yeah. You know, it just... So, so I, it happens. So, and I think that's... We just need to reiterate the point of recovery. Isn't the goal isn't that you never feel anxiety again. It's not that you never have a panic attack again. Right. It's that you're just not scared of it because then it doesn't have any sort of impact on your life 
at all. It's no different than, you know, <clears throat> trying to find your car keys in the morning or missing a bus or <laughs> it, it's an annoyance. It stinks. You don't yeah. want it to happen, but okay, it's not the end of the world. And that is absolutely true. And it starts with that true 100% acceptance and believing that like, I just have, you know what, if I'm going to be sweaty and just dizzy, then screw it. I'm going to be sweaty and dizzy. That's the way it's going to be. All right. It doesn't matter. I'm still the same guy, even though yeah, I'm sweating and dizzy. There's a good bit in, in this chapter where she says, like, don't strive to be normal. Don't strive to be relaxed. Right. Just accept that you're probably looking kind of sweaty and shaky and you're feeling terrible. And just accept that you're going to feel terrible for the next, you know, 20 minutes, half an hour, whatever it is that you're sort of like used to yeah. feeling that for. Just, just. It doesn't matter. You don't have to feel normal all the time. You don't have to feel normal any of the time at the minute. You're just right. trying to not fight something that's completely pointless because that this, is not achieving you anything at the minute. Exactly right. And I think the key sometimes, the thing that stands in the way of that true acceptance and truly floating or bending or relaxing, whatever you want to call it, is that understanding truly believing and gripping that concept that says you're not controlling anything. So, you know, when I used to deal with like, well, you know, maybe some heart palpitations or, you know, that's those skipped heartbeats that I would have, or my heart would feel heavy. I would feel every beat. It wasn't beating any more quickly, but it was like beating in my ears practically. Yeah, I yeah, would spend yeah. all day long checking my pulse and poking and prodding at my chest. And, <laughs> and I was doing nothing. I was controlling nothing. It didn't matter. No. I was just prolonging it in a way. So, it's like being a passenger on a plane and worrying about what that noise was and what that, it's just like you can't fly can't do anything about a pilot, it. Right, you know what exactly. I mean? But like you can't do anything. Even if I was like, I think the engine's on fire. Do you know what I mean? What am I going to do about it? I, I don't have a bucket of water. Right. <laughs> put my trust in the people that do know. So I yeah. have to put my trust in the the bits of my body that have kept me alive this whole time and know exactly how much to breathe and how much to pump yes. my blood around. And do you yeah. know what I mean? Just yeah. let the body do its job. You don't know anything about biology and how to pump a heart. No. Do you know what I mean? No. So just let go. <laughs> and, and I think I, I would add to that. I don't want to get too deep into this because we try to keep this under like a reasonable time frame. But if you are playing symptom whack-a-mole with things that you drink or sniff or rub on your skin or swallow or listen to or like you're still you're not accepting them then yeah. you know like I want to make this feeling go away why why do you want to make the feeling go away because it's uncomfortable well a lot of things are you know what when my favorite hockey team loses that's uncomfortable I don't want it to happen but it does <laughs> so you know I don't I don't know what to say in a way you have to stop trying to control them and and manipulate them and stop them from happening just don't for, for me like what the biggest mistake i made for the longest time because i suffered for 20 years you know uh, before i actually got sort of found the missing piece of information i was looking for which was basically everything that's in this book but for 20 years i was like so i'd done what am i trying to say i completely forgot what i was going to say i yeah so i had a um prescript a repeat prescription of a benzo yeah you know like a valium or diazepam Xanax, and whatever. it was just a, a it was a small dose but it was to take whenever i needed and so i would i'd got myself like i was doing sort of you might call it exposure or whatever i decided at some point in my 20s to not to not let anxiety stop me doing anything so i carried on doing everything i was working i was traveling i was doing everything but i was like white knuckling the whole time my friends had no idea how much distress I was in the whole time, you know, yeah. I didn't really tell anyone or anything. But so, but the mistake I kept making was that every time I felt anxious, so I'd be like on my way to work and just like, oh my God, I'm feeling awful. And I'd take a, a, a tablet to try and like relax myself to, to just get through enough. And it would, you know, maybe take the edge off very slightly. But what I didn't realize I was doing is that everything I was doing to try and avoid feeling anxiety was actually like re um what's the word you know like re it was feeling it was feeling that cycle reaffirming it yeah right, i was reaffirming exactly. that i right. was reaffirming that it was something to be afraid of something to be avoided and like when i sort of discovered that whole thing of like avoidance maintains anxiety it was just like oh so i shouldn't take a tablet i shouldn't try and not feel tense i shouldn't right. try and run away from this and as soon as i did that it was so quick the sort of transition 
because for me, I'd actually already was going out and doing stuff. I just wasn't dealing with the symptoms, which is kind of like what this chapter is all about. Yeah. And it's kind of like this chapter was the whole missing piece for me. And as soon as I realized that, like, oh, it doesn't matter that I'm feeling this or this or this or this. Right. That doesn't matter. And I was doing the stuff anyway. And then, honestly, I was... It took me a few months and I was just completely better, I yeah. would say. Yeah, it doesn't take that long. <laughs> it literally was that. And yeah. I was suffered for 20 years. Yeah, it doesn't take that long. It really doesn't. It's not It's not years and years and years. Although you, you may have still had symptoms even two yeah. or three months but later. It still took me a lot. It took right. me for them to still go away. a longish time. And, and I had a couple of setbacks where I sort sure. of got a few things. And, sure. you know, but that's kind of nothing compared to what I'd been through before, you know, so it, very common, very common. And I think, I mean, it's, there's so, it, it really is. There's so much good stuff in these, however many pages in this one chapter of the book, you know, if you have the book, just read it over and over. I mean, she's really, she's giving you the keys to the kingdom here for sure. Yeah. Um, so I think one of the other things that we should talk about is that that's the thing with acceptance and, and floating. She calls it floating. We'll talk about that. She does mention, um, you know, she goes through each individual symptom. She talks about trembling hands, and she's sweating, trembling racing hands, heart. racing heart. Can I just say one thing about a racing heart? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> Is that in the UK, there was for a little bit a, a, a game show called A Thousand Heartbeats, and it was like a terrible game show. And people, the contestants were wired up to a heart monitor, and they had to answer like questions, like a quiz show, but they had to do it within, so they would count like, yeah. every heartbeat and they had to do it within a thousand heartbeats answer so many questions so obviously the faster their heartbeat the less time they right, had right but so it would show and like they would be so tense like trying to and so obviously the more like stress they got by how much time was running out the yeah. faster their heart would be and people were on like 160 170 bpm just standing in a tv studio answering questions and yet i've seen on the panic disorder group and stuff people freaked out because they're in the middle of a panic attack and they listen to their heartbeat and it's like 140 or something I know. just like there's nothing that's your nothing. heart is fine the heart people's heartbeat goes up because they're answering questions on a game show. So 160, 170, it's nothing. That's right. It's just your heart is supposed to beat fast. Like it's supposed to be able to beat fast. It's trying to like – It's and when it you does. Have a panic attack, it's trying to just help you <laughs> run yeah. fast or fight yeah. and stuff. And so like don't be surprised if you've got a fast heartbeat when you're feeling – tense you know and just now imagine you're on that stupid game show and just and so like they'd be like oh careful your heartbeat's racing but yeah. they meant because you're running out of time to answer questions not yeah. because you're medically in any sort of danger at all and i just i found it like really um it was so like silly and stupid that i kind of found it like really like um, and, and it's true <laughs> uh, you know and i'll mention two other things then about about the heart too because it seems to be a core thing for a lot of yeah. us it was for me um uh, skipped beats like if you experience skipped beats which i i do um you know of course get checked by a doctor i think we've talked about this before but yeah, for the most course, part yeah. they are likely premature ventricular contractions which i was told by multiple cardiologists every human heart has we just don't always feel them it, it's just that there's a couple of cells on the surface of your heart that have decided to sort of go rogue a little bit. And that skip beat, the pause, the big thump afterward, that is a built-in mechanism that's happened over millions of years of evolution where the rest of your heart just beats those cells back into submission. Like you can't, <laughs> those cells are not going to have their way. They are going to get yeah. hit over the head and your heart will be back in its normal rhythm. And there's no danger in that. So It's because it's trying to, it's it's fixing itself, right? It's it is like, fixing itself. So that when you feel it that It knows skip, what it's doing. The pause, no. like, and I know everybody just, you know, it freaks me out. And I used to panic instantly when I would feel them. You have that, that skipped beat, that flutter. There's a bit of a pause. It feels like your heart has stopped beating for a second. And then there's the big thump. And that's just because your heart has filled with extra blood because of the pause. It's called compensatory uh, okay. pause. And then the, the thump is... A lot of blood gets pumped out of your heart at the same time, and you feel that as the thump. Sometimes you feel it in your throat. And essentially, the, the beat, the rhythm-keeping cells are taking care of business. They are, they are doing what they are supposed to do. That is a normal part of a healthy, functioning heart. And yeah. if you are like me and you used to feel your heart beating like it was in wet cement, thump, th even when it wasn't fast, I could feel it in my ears. I could feel yeah, my neck yeah. pulsing. It's only because you are so sensitized to your heartbeat it's no it's beating no heavier than it normally would 
So, yeah. you know, if from a fluid dynamic standpoint, if your heartbeat is at 70, it's not it's not beating any harder mm -hmm. than it. It can't beat any harder at 70 to 70. That's it. So um, yeah. you have to get past those things, too. And she does mention that. And she goes through some very specific things about the stomach and hands and heart, <clears throat> which, yeah. you know, we could go through if we really wanted to. But I think in the end, it's just the concept of like your body is fine. You have to accept that and do it. So, yeah, what what is she when she talks about, you know, she says this thing, no magic switch, um, when she's talking about her heart, you know, your heart. Like, well, okay, even once you've got to the point where you accept this, like we've said, the symptoms will probably still come. You're not going to banish them instantly. That's what she calls the no magic switch. And then she talks about, like, a sore scalp or, you know, it's just tension, muscle yeah, tension. Yeah, yeah. Um, I like when she talks about two things. One is the limited power. Well, two things is putting up with. And I think that's the difference that we've been talking about, that subtle difference. Like she putting up with, make sure you appreciate the, the difference between truly accepting and only thinking you are accepting. Yeah. So make sure you know the difference between truly accepting and just putting up with. So like you were saying, just yeah. white knuckling your way through things. And in the little discussion group we have going on the, based on the podcast I do with Billy, somebody posted a video yesterday that was excellent. She talks about that was, um, who posted that? It wasn't Laura. I can't remember who posted it. I'm sorry. But, uh, it was a great, great video. She just talked into the camera for a couple of minutes and talking about how she was trying to get out there and do her exposure work and she was doing it wrong because of that oh i saw that it was yeah, really yeah. good it was really good yeah, she was yeah. just putting up with you know like i'm just dealing with it. i'm just putting up with it she she had to remind herself like and just let it go just let it go like that was really good so let's talk about the limited power of she talks about the limited power of adrenaline releasing nerves like which is you know your symptoms are as bad as they are there's no yeah. You know, when your heart beats at 150 beats, it beats at 150 beats. It's no worse. There's no such thing as a worse 150 beats. Yeah. Um, if your hands and are what tingling, she says, doesn't yeah. matter. There's a, you, so in a way, she almost challenges you. Like, go ahead, try to make it worse. And yeah, say, exactly. Try to make but it worse. But that's the thing. If you try and face your, and if you try and face the the symptoms, you know, like the David Bowie says, so I turned myself to face me. <laughs> um, so if you like face it and you face yourself and you're like, Okay, what is it? It's just like, oh, it's it's nothing. Like you can't make it worse by looking at it. In fact, you kind of just decrease it by looking at it. In a way. So like when you when you're like, oh, there's this this feeling, this feeling. If you go like, well, what is this feeling? I'm gonna actually. She sort of encourages you to really like examine it and sort of pick it apart and be like, well, what is it? What yes. is this feeling? What is so bad? Is it that bad? And then just relax into it, face it, and and accept it. And like, that's all it is. It's just, it's just adrenaline coming in and, and doing some stuff to make you in a different physical state so right. that you could run really fast or fight, you know, like if it, you had to, right. Which you don't. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. And, and it's that whole thing where, you know, it's, this is your body acting as exactly as it was designed to do, which is doing yeah. it at the wrong time. These are the, it's just the wrong time. It's just bad timing, but otherwise yeah, your, your yeah. body is functioning. You know what? Be, be thankful. Your sympathetic nervous system works the way it's supposed to. It's, yeah, you are working exactly working as you were designed exactly to. Exactly as you came from the factory. It's exactly <laughs> it's just at the wrong time. We just don't want it to happen at that moment, but it's working just fine. So let's let's move on a little bit and let's talk about her, her floating. Because that, that's <clears> kind of like once you've accepted, now you have to start to float. Yeah. So I think acceptance is a cognitive or a, a mental function, like truly believing that this is the way to go. Floating is where you put it into practice, right? Yeah. Yeah. And what I really like is that she talks about floating in, in a sort of exposure way, actually. She says, like, oh, you know, like um, one of her patients was like, oh, they you just they couldn't even walk down the street to go to the shop, you know, like because they were so tense and, and like just felt so awful that they couldn't bring. It was almost like they became sort of like paralyzed with fear. And so she said, you're trying to fight it and pushing. If you're pushing yourself like that, it's kind of like a fight. And she said, don't sort of fight yourself fight your way down the street just float your way down the street just don't really think about it and just float down the street float into the shop buy a thing and float back again you know right. and she said when she used that word float instead of sort of fight with that, this patient she was like she then came like sort of dancing into her office and was just like don't stop me now doctor shall i float off and do something else yeah like, yeah and, she sort of like was almost cured just by changing this one word in her in her sort of vocabulary of what she was doing it's like 
So instead of like, I'm going to really force myself to go and do this, it's just like, I'm going to float myself. And when I was, um, last year, when we started doing this last year, yeah. just before we did this, I'd had a bit of a setback. It was when I was, I'd found out I was pregnant and I had like a really bad setback. And I honestly, I couldn't leave the house. I couldn't go anywhere. And I reread the book, which is why I think we ended up doing this in the first place. And, um, and it was that bit on floating. And I was just like, I'm just going to stop trying to think about this and rationalize it or do anything about it. And I'm just going to float. And I literally floated down to the swimming pool and then literally floated. I remember you telling the story, yes. <laughs> yeah, and I just like floated myself into the car, just floated down, like, and then just, just didn't, just stopped thinking about it, stopped trying to analyze it or do anything and just did it. Yeah. And then I was just like, oh, Okay, and then did that a few more times, and then yeah. honestly, it just went so quickly after that. I mean, because that was just a setback, and so I got better from that just so quickly, you know, within it, like a couple of weeks, you know. Yeah, because you had already done that before. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, you didn't. You just needed a refresher in a way. Yeah, yeah. But I just the the, the floating bit really spoke to me in that. She tried, really She does try it. to conceptualize it. I think uh, when she uses the word floating, she talks about visualizing yourself in cool deep water literally floating or you know moving slowly through this very calm water it's cool it feels good it's you know that that feeling of being in deep water walking through a swimming pool it's it's slow it's 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 graceful it's all of those things and she's i think she's yeah. trying to she's trying to convey i guess that the feeling that you have to have when you're truly floating through these symptoms of just just relaxing and moving fluidly and deliberately and slowing things yeah. down. So you can't I, do anything in a hurry when no, you're like walking through no. deep water. Right. You, know? like you have to just be slow. Like you're thinking slow. about every step. You have to think about every step you take. You have to be deliberate in where you put your feet and where your hands are and, and all those things. So what, when we say like just ignore what's going on and just keep doing what you're doing, you have to, if you're accepting and floating or what I like to think of as bending in the wind and the storm instead of breaking, Bending without breaking is uh, you're moving slowly and deliberately. Just slow everything down. And if you're a crazy person like me and you're doing 10 things at one time because you're constantly multitasking, what I find that for me, it, that's the moment when, okay, stop that for a second and just focus on one task. Just yeah. focus right now on, you know, I can remember having it happen to me and I was working on a thermostat. I was repairing a thermostat. Um, I was being very handy. And uh, I remember I just had to think, I, I started to get that derealized feeling and I was very off balance. And if I moved my head too fast, it was all that visual disturbance. And I remember just thinking to myself, okay, because I was also, while I was working on the thermostat, I was thinking about six other tasks that I needed to do. <laughs> I had to let those go and just focus on, just hold a screwdriver. Now put it in the screw head. Now turn yeah. it, now turn it. And it's, it's, there's something therapeutic about that. Slow everything down, breathe in breathe out, take a step, put the screwdriver down, sit down, read the instructions, you know, and, and you slow it down, you get very deliberate, and this is how you do it. And you just let that storm rage at you and just keep, just yeah. keep moving fluidly, slowly, deliberately, and breathing. And that is how, essentially, this to the symptoms, like, <laughs> yeah, br yeah. bring it, I'm still going to keep going, you cannot stop me. And curiously, the slower you move, the more deliberately you move, the more you try to be graceful in your movement and in your thoughts even, the slower you go and the gentler you go, the stronger you actually are in the face of the yeah. symptoms. So racing against them or beating up against them or running up against them doesn't work. You have to take the ups. You have to be soft in the face of, of yeah. the onslaught. Yeah. That's why I, say, I, I sometimes see people say like, okay, just breathe, just breathe. But like, don't try to desperately relax. Don't desperately breathe to try and right. relax. Just be like, it doesn't really matter that you're feeling anxious. That's, the, that's right. the point. It doesn't really matter if you're relaxed or you're anxious, like just, just accept whatever state you're in, you know, like you right. don't have to desperately get from this anxious state to this relaxed state. You just, just carry on doing what you're doing anyway, yeah. you know, like, and, um, you can and function, I think, yeah, you yeah. can function quite well in a really anxious state, believe it or not. You know, I, I have been at lunch meetings <clears throat> and in meetings with an oh, office yeah. full of people sitting around a conference table when I have been in the middle of raging panic. Yeah, and, and I've I, been on stage, you know, sure. with everyone looking like, at me and, and I'm playing, playing the piano. a solo <laughs> gig and singing and singing. I'm trying to get my breath, you know, and just feeling yeah. like I'm going to pass out or 
explode or just bleh, lose my mind at every single, you know, right, bit. Right, just fine. And um, no, I was great. And everyone's like, oh, what an amazing gig. It's just like, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was going to lose it. I remember doing a career day thing at my kid's elementary school, not to get off on a tangent, but I got invited to do career day. My, I, my daughter was in like fourth grade. These are some young kids. And I had did a slideshow and I was an interesting guy because I'm in like the internet technology business. And so I wasn't, you know, like a plumber or something that they've seen before. So the kids were all really interested. They're all looking at me. The teachers are all there. There's like three classes. I am just at the edge of, I just want to jump out the window. Like I was having yeah. the worst panic attack I'd had in a very long time. But, you know, I just had to keep reminding myself, well, oh, well, just keep doing the slides and keep keep talking about what you're talking about and answering their questions. It's and amazing making how- jokes. And, and it went away in like seven or eight minutes. And yeah. no one had any idea. No one had any idea. Even so. my husband doesn't can't tell sometimes, you know yes. what I mean? And I'm just yes. like, look at me. Do I look all right? You know, if we're about to step into a party or something, I'd be yeah. like, but look, you know, I look crazy. Am I sweating? Have I gone red? And he's just like, I don't know huh? what you're talking, talking about. about. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've had that experience many like, times. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, hey, right. I'm in the middle of a swinging panic attack right now. And the person that I'm with will invariably say, you are? I'm like, yeah. Yeah. So it, that's a really good point. I think part of floating is just doesn't you could you can operate just fine even in the midst of raging panic you can still keep just living it's all right i think one of the biggest sort of issues that people can run into with this is that if you sort of drop everything around you to sort of focus on getting better or, or you know like to focus on your anxiety yeah. in some ways it's good because it's good to like put, put everything away and be like okay i am going to get myself better yeah. but you can also fall into like a, I haven't got anything else to do. And so all I'm thinking about all day, every day yeah. is this anxiety. Now I feel like this and now I feel like this and now I feel like this. And if I walk here, I feel like this. And and that's kind of like not very helpful as well. So I think it's really important to try and keep doing other things and especially with other people people because yeah. if you try and hold yourself together i think it's actually better than just you know like yeah. letting yourself feel how you want to you know like behaving how you want to behave you know like i think yeah. it's kind of good to have to sort of like try and hide it because in some ways it sort of it makes you do it carry on and it makes you not pay so much respect to those symptoms you know yeah, instead yeah. of just being like now i feel like this just be like well okay i do but i've got this thing to do now and i've got to talk to this person or you know whatever it is i just think it's important even if it's like i know lots of people have to stop working or something but like if you just join a a something or like a, a pottery class or a, you know Book like club, anything, anything that yeah anything that has like a social sort of interaction or that you yeah you know or if you work at home but you give yourself deadlines that you've got to do like just you just try and stick to them no matter what and yeah. you say like well, fuck this anxiety i'm not gonna let it dictate every part of my life and so i'm gonna try and at least do these bits of my life whether i'm feeling anxious or whether i'm not you know yeah and um and um, if you can try and, but that's the whole point, isn't it? I mean, if otherwise people would just still be right. happily at work and stuff. So <laughs> but, it's so easy to say, but it's, it's I, again, it's like a subtle, it's a I, subtle I th thing. I think that is really one of the most excellent points I've heard in a very long time. And I think learning how to do these things that she talks about in the book and that we're talking about really needs to be to the best of your ability. And I think sometimes you have to push yourself a little bit more than you think you can do it has to be more integrated into what your life is supposed to be as opposed to let me put everything else on hold and fix this because I've yeah. seen people do that. I, I, you know, I think it would be best if I just drop out of school this semester and take the next three months to focus on fixing this. Yeah, I agree with you. Not so much. It's probably better to try and integrate these things into living your normal life or the life you want to live. So yeah, you make can totally part focus of your day. on fixing yeah. yourself whilst while you're, you're doing, doing this other stuff. In I fact, mean, maybe drop some if you've got loads on. Yeah, like maybe yeah. You, you might need you to know. cut back a little bit because you're you're thinking and this, these are skills that you're learning as you go. But completely dropping out, retreating, and saying, "Well, I'm just going to work on my anxiety for the next three months, and then I'm going to get back into like the world," is is not a good idea. So no. this really, these are integrative things. I think they need to be integrated into your your daily life if possible. So just keep trying to live your life and work on these things at the same time. And she talks about masterly inactivity. I love this phrase. Yeah, that's that do nothing thing. 
and, yeah. and, and learning to do nothing. And I think when we talk about doing nothing, doing nothing, it could truly mean there for me, I know I could literally do nothing. I could literally just sit in the chair and be blank um, while, while I'm experiencing these things. But it doesn't necessarily mean doing absolutely nothing. You might just breathe or work on some basic meditation or relax your muscles. So you're learning how to do – when she means inactivity, she means inactivity with regard to trying to control your state. Like yeah, yeah. fight off the symptoms, make them go away, stop them from happening, You know, stop your heart from racing, stop being dizzy. No. Um, I think masterly inactivity refers to just getting really good at either doing nothing, just letting them come and go, or just doing those – very basic, deliberate things that are going to get you to float through this. And I think what you'll find is your your version of masterly activity will change over time. Yeah. At first, you're you're actively doing the breathing exercises. You're actively doing the muscle relaxation exercises. You're actively trying to remind yourself of meditation skills. Just let the thought go. Let it come. Let it go. You're you're working on it because it's like you're new at it. But as time goes on, you truly become the master of. With respect to your anxiety symptoms or your panic at the moment, you truly are are being inactive with respect yeah. to that. So I could still be shopping and putting things in my shopping cart and being active on, in that part of my brain while being completely inactive when it comes to the anxiety that I'm feeling at the moment. Yeah, yeah and that's the, that's the masterly inactivity. I lo- I've forgotten that she uses that phrase. It's a really good masterly phrase. Masterly inactivity. Ma- you're learning the right way to do nothing in a way <laughs> or learning how not to like react to your symptoms in, in, in a masterly kind of way. This is a really good line. She says, as one young man said, I feel I must stand on guard. If I were to let go, I'm sure something would snap. It is absolutely necessary for me to keep control and hold myself together. And like, so when he was obliged to talk to strangers, he would dig his nails into his palms. Oh my God, I was the master of nails into palms. Wow. And like, and tried to control his trembling body and conceal his state of nervous tension. And he would watch the clock anxiously, wondering how much longer he could keep up this masquerade without cracking. And, and what she's saying is, is you don't need to do that. You don't need to be so tense against it. You're not holding yourself back from anything because no. if you actually let go, it's the first thing we said at the beginning. You just sit in your chair and you relax and you slump in. You relax into the anxiety. It actually can't get worse. It feels like it's going to get worse right. just before you do it. But when you actually do it, it it doesn't. It doesn't no. get worse. Because you're not holding your that's and that's it is a really good quote too. Like I have to hold myself together. I have to keep it together. You're not keeping anything together. You yeah, know, and I have you, to keep watch of myself. Right. Because you know? what are you, what are you going to stop from happening? So think of a couple of different things. Number one, once you're feeling those things, too late. The adrenaline's already in your bloodstream. It's doing what it's designed to do. So you're not going to stop it. It already happened, and you're not going to make it any go away any faster by hanging on and trying to. Oh, I got to keep myself together here. My heart is racing. Yeah. Oh, I got to keep it together. You're actually making it worse. You're prolonging it is what you're doing. You're, yeah, not, you're yeah. not making it worse because we talked about that. Like your hands can't tingle any more than they already tingle. But you could make, make it last it. longer. Right. Yeah. So I think in this situation, worse probably doesn't mean intensity. It probably means duration. And so yeah. if you think about that and say, well, if I let go, is this going to get worse no, because you're, like I said, your hands can't tingle any more than they already do. You can't be dizzier than you already are, and your legs can't wobble any more than they already are. You're already at the worst. Yeah. So what you're actually going to, if you fight it, you're going to make it worse in terms of duration. It'll, it'll keep going. Whereas if you don't do anything, it will go away faster because adrenaline right. will dissipate and no, just- no more will be added. I wish that I'd had like a megaphone just to sort of play into my own ear and go like, everything you're doing is making this just yes. like, you're doing this. You yes. are doing this. Everything Stop. you're doing is wrong, damn it. Yeah. yeah, you're rubbish at this. Stop trying to do anything. Like, <laughs> you, suck, you suck at this. You suck at this. Right. Yeah, you're and you know really what? crap at trying to make yourself feel better. So just stop trying to do it. Right. You are rubbish at this. And in a way... <laughs> That's, you know, I think we make a joke out of it, but it's probably in a way your body is, our bodies are telling us that like, dude, you yeah. suck at this. Like just sit down and relax. And, and I will like, your heart should be screaming. Like just sit down and relax. And I promise I've got I'll go, this. I got this. I'll go back to beating like it's 60 beats per minute. As soon as I can. I got this. Just chill out, dude. You are horrible at this. You cannot make me do this. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I think, Probably, and especially if you're in that situation where you felt like, I've tried everything. I, I do this, I do this, I do this, I still fail badly. Yeah, your body is telling you that you suck at trying to control that. You know, because yeah, we do. Yeah. We can't micromanage that process. When it happens, it happens. So let's just 
decrease the duration. And when you discover that you can decrease the duration almost on demand, all of a sudden you are now in control without being yeah. in control. You've gained control without actually controlling a damn thing. Yeah. Right? You, you can't stop it starting. Nope. I can't stop it starting. Nope. I'm sure you can't stop nope. it starting. But once it starts, I can stop it continuing That's by right. just That's right. doing nothing. <laughs> and, and so in the end, what have we controlled? If we use this method in chapter six of this book, we have actually taken control, but we're controlling something different, right? So I'm not controlling my heart rate. I'm not controlling my hands. I'm not controlling my eyes. I'm not making my body feel any differently but I'm going to stop those things from lasting too long. And then suddenly I do feel like I'm back in control. Like, oh, yeah, I, look, yeah. what I, look what I did. You look know, what I did. Look yeah. what I did. And it, that feeling, and you know yeah. it because you have been there and I see the smile on your face right now. This, yeah. <laughs> and I, I think it's almost universal when we talk about this thing. I smile, you smile. That feeling, the very first time I ever, and this book was a life changer for me. I know I said that early on and, and when we started doing this. Sitting in my mother's like 1984 Ford Escort, yeah, I'm, I'm old. Um, and I remember I had read the book the night before and everything was, whole hell was breaking loose on me. My heart was racing. Blah, blah, blah. I was hard, having a hard time breathing. And I'm like, okay, this is what she talked about. And I remember literally closing my eyes and just sinking back in this, the seat of this car in the driveway at my house. And I'm like, okay, here I go. And it was, it was terrifying. It was like this huge leap of faith. And I remember after like just a couple of minutes, even it might have even been less than that, suddenly feeling like, all right, this is actually the thing. This is this is doing it. And that I will never that feeling will never leave me. Of yeah. like, It's like you've got a superpower. Shit. Suddenly. Yes. All of a sudden, I felt absolutely <laughs> armor plated like yeah. you can you got nothing on me. I got this. And yeah. um uh, it's it's a thing. So even if you've been, you know, we'll try and wrap it up. And I think even if you have been working hard at this for a year or two years or 10 years or six months, whatever it is, and you keep saying, I don't know what it is. I'm doing my exposure. I'm getting out of it. But it's still it's still not working. <coughs> I think it's a good indicator. And I don't know what your thoughts are. This I'd like to hear it. But it's a good indicator that you really haven't made the mental leap to truly accepting and believing that this is the way. Yeah. You know, if you are saying, I don't know what to do about this, I go out walking every day and I still feel anxious. I think the indicator is you have not made that leap of faith. And in the end, there is a leap of faith and there is courage involved. We talked about that, too. Yeah. You know, so it's, it just to me, it must mean that's that, that, that nuance, you, you know. Yeah. If yeah. you're going out and you're walking every day and you're still feeling it after, you know, ages, it must mean that you're not. Except you're just white knuckling your way through That's that right. walk, and you're not going like, well, right. oh, I'm feeling anxious on this walk, but I'll just carry on walking whilst matter. feeling anxious. Yeah, because in the end, if you're going out and, and walking every day or whatever it is that you're doing, and, and I'm not saying that it's all that that what you're doing is for nothing, but I truly believe that this this chapter six of this book, that nuance of truly accepting. Truly, 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 except believing yeah. that you're in no danger and accepting the symptoms and the feelings as as normal at the moment. This is my normal. So stop yeah. stop comparing that anxious state to your normal state at the moment. This is my normal for now for the next, yeah, yeah. next minute, five minutes, ten minutes. Normal. It doesn't matter when you truly, truly accept that. Then you go out for your walk and you feel anxious. You actually don't feel the need to judge that walk a failure. It yeah, doesn't, yeah, it doesn't yeah. matter. I've gone through entire days feeling very anxious and I don't get to the end of the day and feel the need to say like, oh, today, you know, today was a setback because I was anxious today. No. So I, I think that's, that's it. In the end, this is it. This is the linchpin of everything. You have to believe that to be true. So yeah. there you go. All right, so we were going to try and keep it to like 20 minutes. We're now at like 50 minutes. Okay. <laughs> These are always mad. I, I cannot do a podcast that's less than like 45 minutes long. With you, with Billy on my own, it's not possible. So um, we'll, we'll, we're going to keep doing these, right? Like, yeah, definitely. We're going to try, try, try this. So, um, what I there's would say more, is there's more good chapters. There's in the more, book. there's more. The next one is a good one too. Chapter seven is a good one too. So, um, I don't know how regular we're going to be. Holly and I have decided we're going to do our best to try to be very regular. Maybe it'll be an every other week thing. Uh, if we could bang out a couple episodes at a time, it'll be a weekly thing. We'll see, but we will get through the book. And what I would say is if you, if you don't have the book, Go get it if you want to follow just along. Honestly, get it. Just get the book. It's, it's, it's like yeah, it's, it's, three quid or something. It it's is. Nothing. You can find a copy for five US dollars in a lot of different places. It would be the best. Fight. So you know what? Don't buy 
whatever you buy at Starbucks tomorrow, buy this book instead. If, if yeah, you can. Yeah. it's really good. And what I would say is as always, um, I mean, so, you know, I, I'm on, it's that anxiety guy.com. You can comment right there. I, I'm sure Holly follows along facebook.com slash that anxiety guy on Twitter, that anxiety guy. And also there's a discussion group now that focuses yeah, on which podcasts. is really good. It's awesome. It's very awesome. And I'm, I'm going to plug it here. And I know Holly has been really active in it and, um, really helpful. Everybody's been so encouraging and helping each other and rooting each other on it. I freaking love that. I love that. It's just the most awesome thing. So if you find my page on Facebook, facebook.com slash that anxiety guy, like the page, you'll see at the top is a link to the discussion group. It's called the anxiety one Oh one podcast forum. And, and it's actually the, the podcast I'm doing with Billy from anxiety United, but we can absolutely discuss these things in there too. Yeah. It's all, it's, 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 a, it's all in there. So join the group. And it's a closed or, group. So people in your new, they won't, it won't show up in your friend's news. That's right. They won't like know. That. It's all like so private. You have to ask to join the group. We'll get you in and uh, you can join the discussion or just lurk and, and see what people are doing. But it's a good I, I, I think it might be the best place I, I, I keep telling people like oh, comment on the YouTube video feel free to comment I'll, I'll answer you know and stuff but uh, I think that is probably the best place because you get the benefit of other people's questions and you, people are answering each other's questions and there's just yeah. something very positive about that group that I, I, I'm loving right now so yeah me too that is a deal so I'll put the links like in the video description and stuff or on my webpage and all that stuff so Holly this is so cool I'm really happy that we're doing this again Thanks for having right. me again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you guys come back for the next episode. Watch like social media. We'll let you know when it's coming out. And um, we'll get you in the next chapter. Chapter 7 next. Cheers. <laughs>